Greetings, I'm Shad and I'm here at Hedgeend, which is where a medieval fair is being held with Lorne from the School of Historical Fencing. What sources do you study out of in your Higma uh, field specifically? Uh, the school I go to, yeah. we specifically study uh, Fiore Delivery's Flower of Battle, yep. um, the Bolognese tradition of fencing, mm -hmm. so that's uh, the Anonimo and also Capaferro Rapier. Capaferro, alright, beautiful. So how long have you been doing HEMA and what got you into it? I've been doing it about eight months and I yeah. actually saw a documentary on YouTube. Hey, uh, yep. Um, called, uh, Back, Back to, to the, the Source? source. Yeah. Back to the Source. That's Excellent. the one. I loved it too. It was yeah. great. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I'm here and I'm going to be uh, giving some of these things a go. You'll see what they're uh, teaching, what they're training, and who knows, we might even be able to have a bash or two. Absolutely. Sounds great. All right, we'll get to it. So there's a couple of things that I want to mention before we get to watch and enjoy my first fight with a HEMA practitioner. I was invited to come along to this event in response to my video, The Problem with HEMA, and the subsequent discussion that I had with Dave Rawlings. And as was evident by the discussions on the HEMA Facebook pages, this was with the intent to convert me over to the side of HEMA and to teach me how it's done right. Anyone who thinks that I needed to be converted to HEMA or was of the opinion that I felt I couldn't become a better swordsman through studying HEMA never really watched or paid attention to my video. Now, if a HEMA club ever opens up close to me locally, I'll be there fast as anything. There's no need to convert someone who's already converted. You see, I have always been keenly aware of the fact that HEMA provides a wonderful resource in learning how to be a better swordsman. And I've always intended to take advantage of that resource, and indeed actually tried to take advantage of it to the best and most efficient way that I could do it, in learning about it from online resources. Does that mean I'm going to treat the historical sources as gospel? Of course not. I'll give anything a try, like I've given many low stances a try, and if those techniques don't work for me, well, I won't use them, and I'll focus on what does work for me and try and refine and get better at that. Now, out of the people in the HEMA community that have become upset with me, and it's not everyone in the HEMA community, might I also say, there's many, many people who agree with me, but it is the thing that I've just explained that upsets them, that I've found certain techniques and styles in HEMA to not work for me. And that when someone insists that I need to do them over the thing that I am already doing that does seem to work, that that is very counterproductive in becoming a better swordsman. And the thing that they take issue with is that they feel I am unqualified to determine what works and what doesn't. And that it is a very offensive thing that I dare point out something in HEMA that doesn't work. Because how can I know better than a historical master? The thing is, I'm not saying that it doesn't work across the board for every single person who will ever try it. I'm saying that it doesn't work for me. And when I say that, I mean that whatever this technique, stance, or style is supposed to achieve, I have found another way to achieve that that is easier for me to execute. And that could very well be another historical style, stance, or form. Or it could be something that I just tried out and it worked. And saying that I just haven't practiced these techniques enough, in my opinion, is a bit of a cop-out. Because if it legitimately doesn't work, well, I could spend a lifetime trying to learn something that will never work. I would rather improve upon what is working and get better. Why? Because I'm lazy. I am far more interested in being the best swordsman I can be than knowing and being able to perform perfectly every swordsmanship technique. Does that mean I'll be limiting myself as a swordsman? No, because if there is any technique that can do something that my current style cannot, of course I'm going to try and learn it and incorporate it. So all I can do is give it the best go that I can, as fair and thorough as I feel is appropriate. And just because there are certain stances and styles that I don't like, that does not mean that there are not a huge amount of things that I do love and that I haven't taken on board. Because, like I said, Heber is a profoundly valuable resource in learning to become a better swordsman. In fact, it might be one of the best. And I am very, very far from done in my research and study of historical European martial arts. There is so much more that I can learn, and there is so much more that I intend to learn. And I'm sure there's going to be many things that I will take on board, as well as many things that I'm going to disregard. And I look forward to it. Now, the guy that I get to have a fight with is Lorne, whom you saw me introduce just previously. And Lorne has been doing HEMA for eight months. 
So infer from that what you will, but I found him to be a very good fighter, very friendly, very open, he was a wonderful guy, okay, absolute champion. All the HEMA guys were awesome and I wasn't expecting anything different. This is the first time I've had actual interaction with a HEMA club, and unfortunately there have been some very few people, and I mean very few, it's not many, that have been of the opinion that unless I have had direct physical interaction with a proper HEMA club, I don't know HEMA and that you can't learn or practice HEMA to the extent that you can become a legitimately competent swordsman through other means, like being self-taught or practicing in LARP, the two main ways in which I have learned how to sword fight. Now, of course, thankfully, most people can see that that opinion is rather ridiculous, because the way I sword fight is very largely taught and informed by HEMA. But one thing is absolutely true, I have never actually sparred or had an official bout with a HEMA practitioner. This is the first time I've ever actually got to do that and it was a wonderful opportunity to put to the test my self-taught sword skills. And so let's take a look and see how I do in my first official fight with a HEMA practitioner. I'm not sure if you can see me. This is Shad. Wearing a mask and you know it's the first time I've ever actively sparred with a mask. Yes. So, so you hit people on the head. I can. Yes. Uh, this is going to be wonderful. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see if it'll distract me or not, or if I get used to it. Yeah. But there's only one way to find out. Oh, uh, yeah. So I see what you did there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hang on a sec. I'll judge. Okay. Yes. All right. Fight on. Oh! Oh! gentlemen. Some unorthodox sword play. <laughs> Alrighty, so I was fighting like this. <laughs> this is where my glasses were. But how did I go? What do you think? Um, went really well. Hey. Uh, the interesting thing is when you get someone coming from a, a background where you don't know their fighting style, it really changes the game. I think we saw that. But there were some really nice hits from, from you coming through there. <sighs> Particularly coming so through under to the torso, Thank very you. nice. I think about four hits under the torso, so it was really yeah. nice. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I love it. Always loved it. But I can certainly see there is orders of magnitude of stuff that I can learn coming to HEMA because there were some great exchanges. You know what I love most about this? Headshots! <laughs> I love headshots! Bring on the headshots! It changes the game entirely. Oh, beautiful. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank you very much. All right. I gotta get my glasses up. Wait, wait. <laughs> the glasses are falling down again. I was like blocking the block with it and like, that's fucking back. terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to fight with him on the end of my nose. Gee, that was a lot of fun. And because I was able to film this fight, I can then analyze it. And this is one of the exact processes that I do to learn how to be a better sword fighter. I look at what other people do, study, learn from it, and then I also look at what I do, see what works, and see what I was doing that wasn't working. One of the things that I see in this bout that I consider sloppy swordplay are the double death engagements, where we both advance and hit each other at the same time. No, the best sword fighting engagements 
are those ones where you land a hit on your opponent when they don't land a hit on yourself. But of course, having said that, if you make a mistake in the first engagement, and you can see and predict that they're gonna land a hit on you, well, you might as well get a hit on them at the same time. So, I understand that side of the argument. Still, in my opinion, even though it can take a lot of technique to pull off a hit when you're getting hit at the same time, I consider it sloppy. I also have to applaud my opponent. What a wonderful guy. Lorne was an awesome opponent to have a bout with. And I could really experience firsthand the difference in fighting Lorne compared to someone who has no experience in historical swordsmanship. One of the things that I noticed very early on is that he was able to punish me if I engaged him in an incorrect way. If there was an opening, he would take it, especially with how he had his high guard, but then I learned from that. You can see that towards the end of the fight, I was landing far more hits against my opponent, and they were hits in which I was not getting hit back than at the beginning, and that was purely because I came to know the way he fought. I saw that my opponent preferred high attacks and high guards, and my response to that was to hit him underneath it. And nearly all the solid hits that I land in this bout are under the arms and sword of my opponent right in his side, and I actually repeat that several times because I saw an opening in his style of fighting and I took advantage of that as many times as I could. The last part of course which I have to talk about was the final throw at the end of of the fight. Of course, this part was most definitely the highlight for me. And the most interesting thing about this, to me at least, is that I have never, not even once, practice that move in an actual sword fight or sparring session, I have thought about it quite a lot. Specifically what I would do if an opponent got too close or tried to grapple my blade. I thought about it, I picked a move that I felt would work best, which was a throw, and then I rehearsed it in my mind quite a lot, but I didn't practice it against anyone main thing is, I didn't get the opportunity to. So far in LARP, no one actually tries to grab their opponent's weapons. What I did have though, I have had practice in that throw, not in a sword fight, but that actual maneuver. Where? Martial arts. And I've performed that move countless times in one-on-one -on -one sparring sessions, and because of it, I was able to incorporate it into my sword fighting style without actually physically practicing it once. It came out on pure reflex and instinct. And what happened is my opponent came in and he grappled my blade. And because I had rehearsed it in my mind, a bell just rung in my head. Sweep my leg behind his and throw him. And the last observation that I want to point out is in regards to my unorthodox style of fighting, as was said. Of unorthodox sword play. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure, because no one stated exactly what I was doing that was unorthodox, but I'm pretty sure the unorthodox strange thing that I was doing, at least one of those things, and that is my leg telegraph. And this is actually a move that I do quite often. I will raise my forward leg, telegraph that I'm moving it forward for a lunge, and then attack. This is something something that I do intentionally, and it works out quite well. Why does it work? Well, let me explain. This is what I think is happening. And it comes into what is a good engagement and what's a sloppy engagement. A sloppy engagement is when you both kill each other. And so when I attack, I don't want them to attack me at the exact same time, because when you attack, you're always open at the same time. And any noob can just suicide on your sword and hit you back. And so what I want to do is actually tell them, guess what? I'm coming in for an attack by telegraphing with my leg saying, guess what, this is a lunge. And that puts my opponents on a defensive position, usually, not all the time, but usually they will adopt a defensive position. They'll either take a step back or try and make a defensive move somehow with their sword. And by manipulating them to make a defensive move, I am stopping them from attacking me at the same time that I am attacking because I want them to try and defend me instead of hit me back and we both kill each other. And so I purposefully telegraph some of my forward lunges. And then then, often, I will also do another telegraph and raise my sword up. When you raise your sword up in an aggressive lunge, the instinct that I have found the opponents to have is to raise their sword up in defense. And I do that, and instead of bringing it back down for a forward heavy attack, I usually spin it off to the side or behind me or around, specifically around their sword, to the open area. And in this case, it was my opponent's side. And so my forward lunge telegraph kind of leg kick is something that I have developed purely based on how I fight. And I've always used it as a distraction or a misdirect, and it works quite well.
So, would you consider this strange, unorthodox move that I do to be Hema? Well, that just brings up the wonderful discussion that I've been having with the Hema community recently. To my knowledge, certainly this move isn't in any historical treatise. But as we all know, I've been wrong about this before, and the thing is, it doesn't need to be in a treatise for this move to be validated. If it works, use it. And just because I haven't seen anyone do this move before, that doesn't mean that it wasn't done historically. Because if it does work, well that actually makes it a little bit more likely that it was done by someone else. And for myself, I do actually think that techniques like this should be included under the umbrella of HEMA, even though there are other ways of looking at HEMA and considering that not to be historical. And that's perfectly legitimate. I understand that people defined HEMA differently. The issue that I would have would be if someone tried to tell me to stop doing it because they felt it was telegraphing my lunges too much. And I'm perfectly aware of that. That's the whole point of it. That's why I do it. And when I fight an opponent who is able to read that telegraph and see what I'm going to do and actually counter it in response to that, knowing that I'm going to do a faint strike following on from that, well, I wouldn't use this leg move against that specific opponent anymore or would I? It doesn't mean that it wouldn't be useful against other opponents. So, of course, I wouldn't get rid of it out of the repertoire of moves I have in store in my style. And so those were my thoughts and observations in regards to the bout that we have just been able to enjoy. What we have next here is a very casual and fun sparring session that I was able to have with Daniel Pope, who is one of the HEMA instructors. And personally, I've always performed worse with one-handed swords. One of the bigger reasons is I find they actually require more strength and energy to use, and I generally react and fight slower with them than I do with a longsword. And so we get some good hits on one another as we're having a fight, but I think it's clear to see that Daniel definitely wins this fight. But I certainly get a good neck shot in on Daniel in our last engagement, so keep an eye out for it. All right, so this has been my introduction to some of the HEMA clubs here in Australia. So guys, I just want to ask you some questions. Could you explain some of the history of HEMA in Australia and how it's growing and where do you think the future is going to be? Um, when I first started HEMA, a lot of the people from the HEMA scene were also in the reenactment scene. Nowadays, that's not so much the case. We've got a lot more people who are purely HEMA oriented. Mm -hmm. And I think over the last 10 years, that's changed a great deal, to be honest. Okay, how big was it 10 years ago then? The HEMA scene itself 10 years ago was very small. It was quite mm -hmm. hard to find groups. Um, in Melbourne, I had a great deal of trouble finding a group 10 or 15 years ago. Um, however, probably in the last five, six, seven years maybe, um, there's been an explosion of groups within Melbourne in particular and throughout Australia, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, so in Melbourne, I think we've got at least five or six groups now practicing. More, more like eight. More like eight. There you go. Yeah. So. The thing that I want out of, I guess, the future of HEMA is to start spreading out from the major metropolitan areas. So back more into the country, come closer to where I live, and you're going to have someone signing up already. Do you think that's going to take a while though? We've actually got a HEMA in Melbourne marketing committee, and we've actually been working on this for a while. We've got mm -hmm. some ideas, we're doing some trips out into the country, 
doing some workshops and come and try events and we should be getting on that fairly soon. See, see, because I reckon there's actually a big opportunity. I have a local LARP group that I play with that just started up in the Gippsland area and I reckon there will be stacks of people from there who would love to jump into some historical swordplay. And so there's an opportunity, guys. Uh, we've got a guy over in Europe at the moment who's mm -hmm. travelling around Europe going to all of the uh, different HEMA schools. When he gets back, because he's one of our marketing guys, we'll organise it and we'll get on contract with you. That sounds great. All right, well, thank you heaps, guys. Thanks for giving us the demonstrations and saying g'day, and we'll sign off and see you later. Cheers. See ya.